Very struck by a lot of the things you were just saying there. And we'll overlap with some of the things yeah, sure. I'm going to say. Um, one of the things that really strikes me is I've been doing this for five years. Some of you guys have been doing it for a, uh, a bit longer. We've been talking about this for years. <coughs> years and years. We've been talking about standards for years. We've been talking about uh, the need for ambition and flood risk management rising to the challenge. We've been talking about communications. We've been talking about it all for years and years and years. And we get little, little steps. And we all put in hours and hours and hours of work. That's why I'm grey. We need to move on. We need to get a resolution of some of this stuff. So just one slide on this. National Flood Forum is a national charity. We've been going since 2002. Mary was my predecessor, and there she'll be talking next. We work with hundreds of communities across the country. We work um, with many, many communities that have never flooded, and in partnership with local authorities, in partnership with um, many, many organisations, other NGOs, environment agency, water companies, and so on. In each of those communities, we work with communities that have flooded. We're currently working in places like um, Leicester, Woking, Caterham, so on, for things that people have flooded over the summer. We've been doing that for a very long time. And our focus is on the people bit. We don't sell anything. We're talking to people about the issues and listening to them about the issues that they need. Because it's, is, that's the really big thing. Flooding impacts people's lives for years and years and years. It's not uncommon for people to come and start talking about their flooding in 2007. It's not uncommon now for people to be bursting into tears on that, from flooding, what is it, getting on for 10 years ago? It's not uncommon for people not to go on holiday ever because they're worried about leaving their home. And it's not uncommon for people to be up all night, every night, that it rains just checking the drains, just checking the things. And that's the bit that, well, there's just a few other flat action groups and the sort of stuff we do right the way across the country. And it's about people, not stuff. We all, it's very, very easy to talk about stuff. It's very easy to have a conversation about people and for it immediately to migrate into stuff, be it property level protection or you know, whatever it happens to be. But it is devastating and we need to actually I'm sure Mary will talk about this. We actually need to focus on the things that matter. And it's particularly the case for people who are vulnerable. There's a piece I was reading this morning about Miami and how there's huge investments going in along in parts of Miami where there's lots of real estate and how all the streets behind, lying behind, get flooded with salt water coming up through the ground and there's been no investment there at all. People who have the skills, us, people who are professional, who are teachers, who are you know, in business or whatever, can make things happen. The people who can't are the people who often need it the most. They're the people who tend to live in the most vulnerable areas and they're the people who tend to need our help. There's a few points I want to just touch on about lessons from last winter. First, is that we know, because we've seen it, that the places that have built good community-based resilience have actually, first of all, reduced the risk of flooding in places like Keswick and so on. Keswick, for example, went through four floods before it got hit by the fifth. Cockermouth and Keswick versus Carlisle and Kendall. Carlisle and Kendall didn't have flood good, well-prepared, properly prepared flood action groups in place. And the properly prepared bit is the important bit. There is a methodology, there is a way of doing this. Places like Hebden Bridge and Todmonton are doing much better than uh, places like Sowerby Bridge and Copley Bridge. We know that in places where you put that investment in, people are better protected than others. We know that when they do flood, because they will flood, because there isn't such a thing as protected, they will deal with flooding more effectively when it does occur. And we know 
that they, because we can see it with our eyes at the moment, that those places are showing a quicker recovery, a more effective recovery. Okay? And note that that's still underway. There are lots and lots and lots of people who are still out of their homes. We also know from last winter that actually every single scheme, be it a capital scheme, a natural flood risk management scheme, a peer property level protection scheme, or any other sort of scheme, needs to plan for residual risk and have a plan in place. Because a lot of those places that got really hit last time around thought they were protected because the language that we use collectively is all about protection and defence. It doesn't exist. Risk still exists and it's about understanding that risk. We also know that many of the PLP schemes that are currently being delivered are not really that fit for purpose. Right? If you are a homeowner trying to get, whether you're using the grant or not, and you're trying to get property protection into your home to a standard, you, frankly, stand, I don't know whether it's one in ten chance of getting it right, I don't know whether it's a two in ten ch chance of getting it right, or a one in fifty chance of getting it right. But what we do see is a world, for the, for the situation I like to, uh, the analogy I like to use is to say, well, this is actually more like a, a double glazing during the 1970s. There's lots of good people out there, but as a homeowner, how the hell do you find your way through the system? And we really, really, really must come up with a systemised approach that's accredited and sorted for the whole industry as quickly as possible. We've been... I've been pontificating about it for five years, right? It's way too long. And the people that suffer are the people whose homes are being flooded, who are trying to get their lives back together again. We also know that since 1953, when the flood, the state effectively took state control of flooding, people were excluded from that conversation. Because in a sense, we said, actually, we need the infrastructure, we need to make things happen, we need to put things in place. And when you actually look at the complexity of the flood risk management landscape, I bet there aren't many professionals who understand it. It really is quite complicated. So why do we expect individuals to know what a lead local flood authority is? Or the difference between that and the role of the local authority or the highways agency? or whoever else is involved. And there's a big, long list. So there are hundreds of groups out there and individuals who are struggling to get to grips with their flood risk. And frankly, we make it impossible for them to do so. Right? The words that we use, the language that we use, gets in the way of people being able to do stuff. If you go to some of the flood groups, as I do, and you actually listen to what they do, and you listen to the issues that they are trying to tackle. Frankly, it's like a Hollywood movie, what they're going through. They need Oscars to actually achieve the things that they're actually trying to achieve. We get in the way, regularly. And they achieve amazing things. I'll show you a few in a minute. For now. OK, so this is the Woodlands Estate in Liverpool, a very deprived area, ex-council housing, uh, significant flood risk from a number of sources. Um, what came as part, as part of the DEFRA Flood Resilience Community Pathfinder programme, and we have a view of the group here and me showing off a flower pot against the flood resilience door. But anyway, <laughs> the, um, they had a, a batch of property level protection, but more importantly, what they've done is they've linked that into a local flood watch scheme, so they can predict when flooding is going to come. They've worked with the agencies to reduce their flood risk. They're currently working with United Utilities because miraculously um, the locals have realised that there's a, um, a, the, the flows at four o'clock in the morning are rather different to the rest of the year, or the rest of the day. And um, so they're trying to sort that one out with the United Utilities. They've challenged partners. They've uh, done a tree planting scheme to actually uh, act with some of the suds. They've developed a, uh, a programme with a local theatre. 
So they've done all sorts of things in a community that typically most people would say, actually, that's going to be a hard to reach group. That's going to be difficult. And they've got practicing as well. They've got a set with their property level protection scheme. These guys in Worcestershire started in 1998. Every year they do something different. They have, uh, they have a property level protection scheme. They have, uh, you can just catch it, where they've lowered the floodplain. They've scooped out um, sediment underneath the, underneath the bridge to enable the flow to grow better. They've also worked with farmers upstream to uh, create storage for water that comes down into the village. They've worked with planning authorities to reduce development in a neighbouring authority, which they realise impacts on them. And you could say, well, what out of that, what did they actually do? And they've done a lot more as well, by the way. <laughs> what they've actually physically done was probably not that huge, but they made it happen. And they've worked with partners to make that happen. And they need the support to actually enable them to take to cr control so that they can get the control of their flooding back into their lives and that they can also drive that process forward, because nobody else is going to. It's Rob and Derek, by the way. And they've every year done everything, done something different. So year by year, they've built up the resilience of that community. They go and practice their PLP. They've got a maintenance contract with a supplier, and so on. St. Dennis and Southampton, really difficult flooding. Tidal flooding, groundwater flooding, surface water flooding, uh, and river flooding. Okay? Combination, physical measures, there's a few. There's a few curbs and things in street level. They've got property level protection. They've got um, temporary flood barriers. So they've organised, they can close off the road. They can um, put up the temporary flood barriers. They've got a system for making sure that everybody's got their property level protection in place. They've got a system for making sure the street next door, all the gates are shut, which are floodgates, to make sure it doesn't creep through from one street to another. They have, we did, we've run scenario days with them, we've done uh, practice events with them, and they go and lead it. So all of a sudden, they've now can control, because they can see when the tides come in, they've got somebody sits on the surge watch and watches that from uh, along, and so they protect each other. They are taking the lead. They have got the systems in place. They are roping in the council. They're roping in us to actually help them do that. Buckingham, similar story. We get invited twice a year to their flood scenario events where they practice, where they have a day on the market stall. They involve the local community. They have a deal with the insurance company. They have a deal with the local authority. They have a plan in place to protect vulnerable people until the emergency services arrive. They practice that plan. They lead it. Okay? They can take control. They might well flood in the future, but they are running it. That's the important thing. This is Thames. They did flood subsequently. PLP very often only works when you get everybody in place. There's no point in, drop in doing property level protection on a, roof, a row of terraces, and you leave the mid, one of the middle ones out. Now, we know that, and yet, and yet, what have we seen this winter? Time and time and time again, property level protection going in on a single property or a group of properties without that happening. It's outrageous, actually. It's absolutely outrageous. Some of the resilience measures will work inside of home, and that's good, and we need to promote that as part of it. But the benefit is of working to create a flood action group beforehand and to actually do the groundwork before you do a property level protection scheme means that you do get all of the houses in a row together. You do get that what, the opportunity not only to do that property level protection, but actually the opportunity to go and enable that flood action group to do all the other resilience stuff that, Graham, you were talking about to take it forward. Because we have to remember that we may think about the property, but it's actually about thinking about that water from the point at which it lands on the ground and how you manage it every single step of the way along the road, all the way to the sea. Because at each 
point it moves, you have an opportunity to reduce your flood risk. You have an opportunity to do lots of other environmental and social benefits as well, but you need to be thinking about that bit of water all the way down. And it might be soil management, it might be tree planting, it might be upline storage, it might be um, shaping water around the edge of a settlement. It might be culverts. Every single scheme has, has uh, gullies, highway gullies as being a big issue. Uh, culverts, it might be warning systems, putting warning systems on culvert trap screens so that you don't get them filled with trash and therefore flooding. It might be early warning things so that people can move out. Lots of new technology, lots of new telemetry that allows people to do that. It only works if you've got a proper flood action group working on it. It can be all sorts of things um, in terms of building the resilience, knowing what to do in a flood, having property, having <coughs> equipment on hand to be able to use that effectively. I mean, places like Hebden Bridge, you know, some of they didn't see some of the emergency services for several days. Okay, let's be clear: the people in Hebden Bridge and Todmorden saved themselves, and literally they were pulling big people out of buildings. Okay, because they knew what to do. Right. Let's be clear. We have to get the focus onto the people bit and its support of supporting people. Okay. So there's some benefits I've listed. Access. We can access a high proportion of the properties in a place for, resi for whatever sort of resilience you want to be uh, talking about. We, a community-led approach done in the right way supports a systems-based approach. I am tired of just talking about products. Okay? We need a system which actually says, just like a, a fire alarm or a, a burglar alarm that goes in, you don't buy a burglar alarm, you buy, when you put it in your house, you buy somebody coming in telling you who's accredited, who specifies the right sort of alarms, an alarm that's uh, certified, accredited, installed by somebody who knows what they're doing, who's accredited, uh, linked into a maintenance contract, and preferably linked into an insurance contract as well. That's where we need to get to. I don't care wh whether it's this particular system or another system, but that's the system we need. Okay? End-to-end, -end, so that when a home owner, or a householder, or a business, or business actually purchases some of this stuff, or agrees to get involved with some of this stuff, they know what they're buying. They know what they're getting into, and they can have confidence in what comes out. And I'm not surprised, frankly, that underwriters up until now haven't been confident about building this into insurance, because without a system like that in place, why would they? They've got no way of getting any sense of the benefits of resistance and resilience. Community groups also offer the benefits of shared learning, peer-to-peer -peer support. Now, which way did However good the modelling, however wonderful modelling, which way did the water flow down that street, really? Right? Modelling is great. Let's not denigrate modelling. It's fantastic stuff, but it's only the first part of the picture. The, real, the other bit of the picture is what really happened on the ground and why. And we actually need to put those things together. It also means that you can have ongoing maintenance and practice that isn't, you know, to get, you do need the individual contracts, but actually they can be enhanced so much more by getting people to practice together, but actually do things together. And it means you can provide support for the vulnerable, as we did in that Buckingham example. It's the people in the community who make sure that there aren't people stuck in buildings. there's an opportunity to do a hell of a lot more with that starting point. We must accept that the, the property is a really important bit of it, but it's only one bit of a much bigger picture. And we know that the benefits of community-led flood approach mean that they, people handle flooding much better. It reduces the risk, but also it means they recover more quickly too. Uh, so communities working in partnership, and the in partnership bit is the really important word. Every single successful flood action group, every successful community is working with their local authority, with the environment agency, with water companies, with NGOs, with ever whoever the local landowners are. Really critically important. I also want to do a flag. 
we're just going to run a, a conference. We've been dealing with insurance for the last four or five years, and it's brilliant that flood re's come in, because it now gives us an opportunity to work to actually get to that target. Okay, what is the target, by the way? We haven't got it. You mentioned it, and it's great. Uh, we have not got an ambition, collectively, as a country, about what does good look like. What's the end point in this? Well, I've got two end points. One is that the, by the time we get floodery through floodery in 23 years or whatever it is, we actually don't need another market intervention. Right? We don't need another floodery. My other one is Mrs. Miggins should have an expectation that when she takes out a mortgage, she can get through the lifetime of that mortgage with, I don't care what the number is, but a number which, actually, uh, which represents the risk that she's got of being flooded, and it needs to be a low number. So we need to characterise that. Um, we're running, so I said we've done, the flood re's come in, brilliant, there's still lots to do on insurance, claims management, small businesses, etc. But the next big thing is around the built environment. It's around the things that we're building now. It's around the sp spaces, the existing environment that we've got in there. How do we know that the developments that we're doing now, the things that we're doing now, are actually going to be fit for purpose in 30 years' time? How can we mitigate the thing that worries people most? Well, there's two things that worry th people most who are at risk of flooding. One is insurance, and the other is development, and the impact that that will have on, on uh, their lives. So this conference is going to att address that. Uh, we've got the minister coming, we've got Lord Mayor invited, we've got various people coming along to that, and we're hoping to start a discussion. We're hoping to start in the same way as we did with uh, flood insurance. We're hoping to actually get into the discussion, get people talking. Please come along. Thank you very much. It'll go on our website in the next couple of days. Bye-bye. Thank you.